Our Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians 10 to 31, or 10, 31. Well, I've lost it here on mine, so I'll read it here. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever, whatever we do, let's do it for the glory of God. And our second reading is Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Both of these is about whatever we do. Let us put the Lord first. These are God's words. Amen. So we are looking at rethinking what we do. Rethinking prayer. Rethinking worship. Rethinking what churches, rethinking ministry, and a few other things. Now, the reason why we're doing this isn't because what we were doing before was wrong. We need to understand that. This isn't about saying what we did previously was wrong and so we need to rethink everything. It is about renewing our minds. Be transformed by renewing, and by renewing means continually a process in which you do things once and then you look at how things can be grown from there. And so today we're looking at rethinking ministry. If I were to ask you, what does the term ministry mean to you? What would you say? What, what do you think? If I said, what is ministry to you? Would you say well, it's probably someone who is working full time in the church, someone who's possibly paid, but whose purpose and job, if we say, is working in the church. Or maybe it is um, a, a program or something, a ministry program like youth ministry or something like that. Maybe you think it's ministry in terms of the government, ministry of transport, a ministry of hospitality, or ministry of um, whatever some of the government people do or not do. But it's ministry. But how about the ministry of stacking chairs? Is that a ministry? What about the ministry of putting out the bin? The ministry of hoovering? The ministry of getting here early and, and getting everything ready? Are those ministries? You see, if you Google ministry and look at the definition, you tend to come up with a government program or a government title or someone who works in the church. That is what people think ministry is. But for those of you in the church who help out, whether you're a leader or help out, why do you do what you do? And I, I genuinely want to ask that question. Why do you do what you do? And before you say, well, I've been told I have to do it. I, I'm really, well, my wife said I have to be here. I'm, I'm not saying that happens, but why do you honestly do what you do? Think about that. Why are you guys here doing the teas and coffees? Why are you here setting up the chairs? Why are you here helping with the youth? Why are you doing what you do? Do you feel obligated? Do you think, well, no one else will do it? Do you think, well, it's my Christian duty to kind of do this stuff? I'm gonna park, I want you guys to park that idea right now for that answer, why you do what you do. Just park it for a second, okay? I now want you to ask, or I will answer this question, why do we do what we do in church? Consider all the activities that we do in church. Why do we do them? Why do we have Sunday clubs? Why do we have youth clubs? Why do we have toddler clubs? Why do we have um, coffees and teas clubs? Why do we have all of these things going on in church? We don't have 200 members. Why are we doing all this stuff? Why aren't we doing enough? Why aren't we doing more? There's uh, I, the, the book that um, I wanted to show you guys, and I, I kind of looked at it at home, but it talks about the minister, Dave, who got up, and everyone knew it was that time again, that time of the year for volunteers, where the minister would get up and say, we need volunteers for this. We've got all this space. We need you people to do this and to do that. And internally, some people will, would get themselves ready at this church because they knew what was coming and so they already had a reasoning of why they're not going to do it. Oh yeah, 
three years ago, I volunteered. I was told it was just going to be once a month, and I'm doing it every single Sunday now. A deacon got up and, and thought, no, 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 no. I'm not doing anything this year. I'm not getting caught out, even if he cried. He cried last year, and it made me feel really bad, and so I volunteered. It's not going to happen again. And so the church was preparing itself for that volunteer drive, and the minister was preparing to get the volunteer. What's it all about? You see, when it comes to ministry, both as an activity and the act that we do in church, I want to go through a typical church planning session and see if this sounds familiar. Someone comes up with an idea. You hear another church doing something and you think, this would be great. We could do this. You see a need and you think, oh, we want to help out the need. I think this is an idea that we can do as a church. An outreach program, this is something that would benefit everyone. Let's do it. There's then a drive for volunteers. We need people to get involved in this. Here's the idea, here's the plan. We need people, we need volunteers. Just sign here. Trust me, it's only gonna be once every other month. I promise you that. But if you happen to do every month, well, it's not my fault. Just sign here, does it doesn't matter? As long as you can do it, just sign here. The leaders then sell the program. Look at what we're doing. And it's kind of a, a pride thing. I'm sorry to say this, but it is a pride thing when you can say, our church does all of these things. What is your church doing? And so the leaders kind of say, look, this is going to benefit us as a church. It's going to benefit the community. This is great. This is wonderful. We want everyone to get behind it. And then the church carries out the activity. In the, field, field, um, in the film, A Field of Dreams, the character played by Kevin Costner is given a vision. I don't know if anyone has seen it. It's late 80s, early 90s. But he's told, what, what's the phrase? If you, if you build it, they will come. And so he had this vision, build a baseball field and they will come. It was in the middle of nowhere, um, which only in America you can imagine, just miles and miles of nothing. I think it was in a cornfield or something. Or was that Children of the Corn? I, I can't. Oh, what's it called? Never mind that last comment. <laughs> but we want people to get behind it and we want to do it. And so it doesn't matter about what the ministry is. We just need to do it. And even if the program doesn't actually do what we are calling it to do. So if we had a program and we said we want to get more and more people in the church or we're doing a financial drive and we want to have more and more money or we're doing an outreach and we want to get out to there. Even if it fails or doesn't achieve what we set out to, it doesn't matter because the members go, but we've done it. We've done the missional stuff. We've done the outreach stuff because we were a part of the program. And the final step of this drive is that no matter what, there's an un written rule in churches. Whatever happens, do not stop the program. Don't stop it. Because you'll hurt those people who come to it, or you'll hurt those people who attend it. Don't stop it. And so what happens is the church then invests more resources, more money into this program. So what you end up is a church full of programs which are being supported by worn out people who continually do the same thing, hoping something will change, but not taking the steps needed to change it. Because if it's something you've always done, you don't know who you are if you're not doing it. And so you keep on doing the same thing over and over again. So let's look at the people in this ministry. There's a sad story of a man who signed up to be on the welcome team. And he did it for years. And he greeted people, always a smile on their face, and everyone enjoyed seeing him, and he would greet and greet. And it was fantastic, and he did it for 50 years. And unfortunately, he came down with a disease, and he was bedridden. And so the, the leaders went to his house to pray over him. And as they came in, they noticed loads of musical instruments. They noticed photos of him in different bands. And so one of the deacons said, 
Dan, the fictional name. We didn't realize you liked worship stuff. We didn't realize you liked singing. Oh yeah, it's been my passion for years. Another one said, I don't, I don't understand it. I've never seen you play a musical instrument. I never realized you were so good. Oh yeah, been doing it since I was a, a toddler. One deacon then said, why on earth did you not sign up to be on the worship team? And the man said, well, the worship team practice while I'm on the hospitality team, welcoming people. And another deacon said, well, why didn't you quit and do what you're passionate about? And he replied, no one else volunteered. And I thought it was my Christian duty to do it. In Acts 6, we read this. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve disciples summoned the full number of the, uh, summoned the full, sorry, the twelve apostles summoned the full number of disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. These are quite harsh words when you sort of really go into it. Therefore, pick from among you some men of good repute, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint this duty to, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, if you look at the Greek word for this ministry that they talked about, the ministry of the word, the word ministry is actually the term diakonin. I don't know if any of you find that helpful to know the Greek stuff, but I would love to, to learn Greek, but I just don't have the time for it. But it is, it is helpful to sort of recognize that the English language does a really poor job of coming up with actually what the words mean. But it means to serve. So they needed to serve the gospel. They then said we shouldn't serve tables. And the word here is diaconia, which means, can you guess? Serving. They needed other people to serve in those practical areas of church life so they could focus on serving by preaching the gospel. The apostles, using their spiritual gifts of preaching and teaching, served. Those with other gifts and specifically appointed by the church members, served. And those left in the church, served. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 says this, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each, I want to stress that amount, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given the Spirit of utterance of wisdom, to another knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another workings. All of these by the same Spirit. To each. So every single one of you has been given a spiritual gift. Whether you choose to use it or not is up to you. But all of you have a spiritual gift. When you become a, a Christian, whether you accept God in your life, when you accept God in your life, the Spirit produces in you this gift. And this gift is for a purpose. Romans 12 says this, Just as each of us has one body with many parts, these parts do not have all the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, but with different gifts to all those for the common good. And there's not a time limit here. Just because you're older doesn't mean that gift is gone. I have met a lot of older people who have blessed me many times more than some of the younger, really go at it Christians. Your spiritual gift may change, but your gifting doesn't go away. Until you go to heaven, until God calls you home, each and every one of you still has a gift which can be used for his glory. But when it comes to the activity, the program, how do we choose the right ministry? How do we know what is right? There is an unfortunate story and I, I googled this and there's, there's a, it, no one is saying whether it's true or not. Some people say it is and there's some background history. But it says this, a man was given a job in a lighthouse 
And he was able to, to have oil for the lighthouse. And he was given oil every month. He shipping of oil. Keep that lighthouse, keep the light burning. That was his mission, that was his task, that was his purpose. And one month, there was a terrible hardship. And he said that one day a woman came up to him and said, look, we've got no food. I just need a bit of oil to bake some stuff because we don't have any. Can you give me some oil? And he said, yes. And it was a few days later, there was a huge storm. And people were left out late at night, seeing the lighthouse. They came and knocked on the door and said, look, our lamps are out of oil. Can you please share some for us? The man said, yes, of course, I can, I can share. Towards the end of the month, he realized he had run out of oil. And as a result, it's estimated seven ships ran aground with a couple hundred people dying. The authorities came to him and said, what is going on? What did you do? And the man just said, oh, I thought I was doing the right thing. There was so much need and I was able. And the authorities said, no, you had one job to do, one purpose, and you failed in it. You see, when we look at programs in the church, and I, I have to say, I, I've struggled with this because I'm, I, I want to do as much as we possibly can. If there's one thing, hopefully some of you guys have recognized by now, I would love to do lots of stuff. I want this church open every single day with something going on. But we need to start with the need. What is the actual need in the church? Not what is someone willing to do, but what is the actual need? To know this, you need to listen to people. We need to listen to those in the church, but we also need to listen to those outside the church. The church isn't here for the people in it. The church is here for the people outside. So what are the needs outside? Do we know what this neighbor here next to us, what, what their needs are? Has anyone ever asked? How about this neighbor right here? Does anyone know what their actual needs are? We need to start with an actual need. This um, um, warm church, I think it's a fantastic idea, fully support it. It is a need. It is a definite need. I'm, I'm hopefully all of us can agree that is, that is a need. But would it be wise to start a warm space up in the middle of Mayfair, where the average house is something like 600 million pounds or something ridiculous? <coughs> the need is there, but it's not necessarily relevant to be put there. So we need to know what is our need. How can the church help the family's need, and how can the church help the needs outside? Secondly, we need to match the need to the mission of the church. There are countless things a church can do, and it's never-ending. <clears throat> so as I was saying about this lighthouse, everything that this man did was wise. Everything he did was gracious. Everything he did was loving. But it wasn't his purpose. And that's a very hard thing to say when you've got someone who's desperate to cook and they've got no oil. What do you do? How do we make that decision? That is really, really difficult. Our current mission here at Holy Lodge is to know Jesus and make Jesus known. So anything that we do, anything that we do in church should fulfill that mission. We should be asking ourselves, if we do this, will people come to know Jesus? And will, it will help us to come to know Jesus more. That's how we make sure that we're doing the right thing. Fourthly, and this is probably one of the most difficult things, we have to wait for the leader. There's a huge difference between asking someone for help to do something. You know, I, I, I really want to make this clear. If, if I'm saying we need to stack the chairs, I hope some of you aren't going, well, that's not my spiritual gifting. I'm not going to do that. There's a huge difference between your spiritual gifting and actually just serving. Your spiritual gifting should be your primary focus. <coughs> but your helping is kind of different. So we can still help each other, encourage another, serve one another, support one another. But are you focusing primarily on what your spiritual gifting is? 
And when it comes to activities, who's the leader? Who is going to take on this role because they feel spiritually gifted and able to lead it? And a good way, a good way is to think, how does this person work? If this person is involved in something, are they encouraging other people to get involved? Are they supporting other people? Do they, do they come alive when they talk about it? You know, Stu and them will, will understand. When I talked about the men's minis- uh, going to the men's gathering, it, it fills me. I love it. And Matt, you'll know. I love it. I love it. And it will be evident in the way I speak about it. It's wonderful. It's great. And that's what the leader should be doing. They should be saying, this is a wonderful thing. They should be looking for the growth. They should be encouraging some, you know, the support. But we should be waiting for that leader, not doing and hoping a leader will come along. The leader should be the one to say, I'm ready to do that. Let's drive it forward. Let's go for it. We should be building on gifts. In the film Chariots of Fire, Eric's sister asked him, why are you going to the Olympics instead of doing something else? And he replied, because God made me to run and to run fast. And when I'm running, I feel his glory on me. When we are doing what God has gifted us to do, it will be evident. How many, I'll ask you to raise your hands, how many who are currently employed in a job sometimes go, oh, going to work again. Oh, I'm frustrated. (laughs) Oh, 20 more years till I retire. Oh. (laughs) But this is the thing about gifting. When you are doing the, when you are serving God in the gifting he has given you, you won't want to stop because it will be a joy because you're doing what he's asking and he's, he's filling you up with that. It's what he's designed you to be. It is the key that fits that lock. It works and you recognize it. We will then have teachers who can teach, administrators who administrate. We'll have people who are in the right spot doing the right thing and it will become evident. It will become evident. And that's the key thing. Is it evident in the leaders that we have? Is it evident in the helpers we have? Is it evident in the things we are trying to do? And I'm not saying it isn't, but it's a question. This is about that rethinking. It is about having that vision of going, where are we going forward with all of this? Will it work? See, the person who will eventually take on the leadership role, someone once said to me as as a supervisor, he said, my role, one of my roles is to find my replacement. And that's another key thing about leadership. When that person is in the right spot and they're doing very well and and they're they're just thriving, they're also looking for those who will help encourage, support them, and eventually take over. Build on the gifts. And then review regularly. Something so many churches fail to do. Review your ministry. What was our purpose in this program? It was to do this, this, and this. Have we achieved it? No. Right. Are we going to be bold? Are we going to say, maybe we need to stop? And as I said, for churches, it's like, well, if we stop, what are we going to do? God knows. Isn't it more important to do what God is asking us to do than what we want to do? For years, some of you may get this, some of you might not. Sorry, and I do keep moving. Um, for, for years, bodybuilders would pose, just bear with me in this, but they, were, they would pose using the style of the weights they would lift. So if they were doing a front double bicep, they would pose as if they were lifting the weights. Um, believe it or not, I did that for a few years. It was very strange. Um, but that was going on for years. And then in 1969... A certain Austrian named Arnold Schwarzenegger lost to Sergei Oliva. And he said, no more. So this bodybuilder, this up-and-coming bodybuilder, 
who saw everyone doing the same thing, thought, I want to do something different. Do you know what he did? He took ballet lessons. Is anyone aware of that? Arnold Schwarzenegger took ballet lessons. The reason why is because ballet people, well, I don't know what they're called, ballet ballerinas. <laughs> they obviously, I should know this because Fionn took it for a bit, but they have a way of flowing and moving. And so Arnold did this class with, with his mate Franco, and they learned that as they were doing a pose, it wasn't just boom, it was kind of fluid and nice, easy movements. Um, but he changed everything because he looked at what could we do differently. They re-examined, they reviewed it and thought, it's not accomplishing what we want to accomplish. Let's be bold. Let's try something different. Will it be easy? Of course not. Could we, as Holy Lodge, do that right now? Again, I'm saying, don't stop everything and don't everyone step down, because that would be a nightmare. But how can we move forward from today? When it comes to personal gifting, can I ask you this? Remember when I said, why are you doing what you're doing? Ask yourself what your gifting is. Does everyone here and everyone at, at home, do you guys know what your spiritual gifting is? How many here would say, and you can raise your hands or not, how many here would categorically say, I know what my spiritual gifting is? Some people do. Okay, I, I think I know one of my spiritual giftings, hence why I've left my job and come into this. I, I believe because I followed through with it. Some of you may disagree. Some of you may say, well, but I, I believe that's my spiritual gifting. But what is your spiritual gifting? And if you don't know, can I ask you to seek it out? Because God has given you this. God has given you this gifting. Do you know what it is? If you really, truly don't, Ask one of your close mates. What do you think my spiritual gifting is? What do you think I am good at? What do you think allows me to fulfill God's purpose? Because if you don't know what it is, you could be falling so short of what God could do through you. One of the things that I've always wanted to hear, well done, Thou good and faithful servant. Not everyone is going to hear that. Can I make that very clear to everyone here? Not everybody will hear that. I want to be one of those who will. And in order to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, I need to know what I, I need to do. And by doing that, I need to know what my gifting is. And by doing my gifting, I then need to act upon it. And if you don't know what your gifting is, can I suggest, please, find out. Speak to us. Maybe that will be something we can look at as a church, what our spiritual gifting is. Because all of us have it. Whether you know God or not, I created you. I know your inmost being. I have a plan and a purpose for you. Secondly, if you're currently doing something in church that matches your gift, ask if God is calling you to be a part of it. So if there's something going on in church right now and you're currently not doing it, not involved in it, not helping out in any way, this is not a drive, I'm aware of time, sorry, this isn't a drive for volunteers, but I'm asking you, is this something in which I think God is calling me to be a part of? We need to know. But there's also a flip side to that. If you are currently doing something, ask God, is this still the gifting that you want me to do because things change and I know the things I was gifted at many years ago I'm definitely not gifted at now because I've I've changed God has worked through me and he's changed my life in a certain way and so that was then and this is now the problem is when you try and stay a square and things have moved to be a round hole one of the two things gonna happen either you won't fit or you'll keep hammering yourself until you do fit Either way is not good. And fourthly, pray about what the needs are in church. As we move forward in church, and I think every church needs to do this, and many don't, what are the actual needs? Write them down. Speak to the neighbors. When we do messy church, ask people. When we do, um, um, like coffee mornings, when we have people come in here, ask them, what's, what's your need? 
What is your actual need? And let's see how we can facilitate that as a church. There's a lot that we can do. And I'm, I'm just finishing now. There's a lot we can do in church. And I get, as Christians, we want to do our, our Christian duty. And I think there's a lot of us, and that was definitely including myself, that feel obligated to do things. No one else is going to do it. I guess I'll put myself forward. It's such a, a lovely, wonderful thing to do. I know God will bless it. And if no one else is going to sign, I, I, I'll put myself forward for it. It's going to be so difficult to actually say, you know what, I'm available, I'm free, but I'm not called to do it. And I'm going to step down. Because if it's right, and hear me out here, if it is right for the church to do something, and if it's God-given right to do it, he will appoint the right person to lead it. I want to say that again. If we are doing something which is right before God, and he's asked us to do this, he will appoint the right person for it. It's important we look at that. I'm going to stop there, but I've recognized with the gifting, it's difficult. And I want you guys to know your gifts, because if each of you have a gift, and you do, we need to be using it. Would anyone uh, not agree with me on that? Do, do we think we shouldn't use our spiritual gift? Or do you think we need to be using our gift? Maybe it's just the one thing. I don't know. But God does. But let's journey this together. Let's find out what your spiritual gift is so that we can be blessed. Because I can guarantee, I guarantee you this. If you are using your spiritual gift, God will bless you in it. And if all of us here in this church are using our spiritual gift at the right time, at the right place, with the right need, this church, his church, will grow magnificently more than any of us could possibly imagine. I think that sounds amazing. I hope you do as well. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and, and we've just looked at gifts and the ministry of doing things, Lord. And as Christians, it's, it's something that's difficult to kind, of, to kind of divide the two. And so we just pray. We just pray that you'd give us that wisdom, give us that guidance, give us that encouragement, give us that boldness to step down, give us the boldness to step up. Help us to do your will in every situation, Lord. Help us to put aside the things that make us happy and actually look at doing the things that make you happy, that will put a smile on your face so that at the end, we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Amen.